Sisi. The early church father, St. Augustine, was once asked about time. And he said, time is something that you think you understand until someone asks you to explain it. In the modern world, we think of time in more of a linear fashion. There's a beginning and there's an end. Our lives are that line in between. But in ancient cultures, they often thought of time as more of a circle. And we do too, in some respects. Spring, summer, fall, winter, spring. We have morning, afternoon, evening, nighttime, and it comes back around to morning. Even in our own lives, as we celebrate our kids' birthdays and anniversaries, these are circular in nature. It goes around and around. And even our secular calendar, January, you get to December, you start all over again. We can't escape the fact that we're stuck in these structures and rhythms and that things repeat. Instead of denying it, the church embraces it. We embrace the fact that we're in this, this beautiful circle as we focus our attention on Christ. In a little over a month, we'll once again be celebrating a new year. There will be funny hats, champagne, the dropping of the ball in New York City. And maybe some of you will stay up to usher in the new year. Others of you will say, it will come in just fine without me being awake. The church beats the secular year to it. Next year, next week, sorry, will be a new year of the church with the first Sunday in Advent. And Advent is this time of waiting. It's a time of longing and yearning. We put ourselves in the shoes of those early believers who were waiting for the Messiah, for Jesus to come. But we know that Jesus has already come. So we look for his coming again on the clouds of heaven when he'll come with the angels and he'll bring his people to be with him forever. We also remember how Jesus still comes to us in the sacrament and in his word to strengthen us and to assure us for that life to come. During Advent, we repent of our sins, but we look to Jesus we look to that day when we will see him coming on the clouds. And in our reading from St. Luke, we hear the angel Gabriel announce that Jesus would be the King Most High. This little child born in the manger would be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we respond with a song. Come, O come, Emmanuel. Reading from God's Word, Luke chapter 1. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. The kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. This is the word of our Lord. We'll continue with our next hymn. The children are invited to come forward during the first verse.
morning. How are you guys? You look tired. Too much turkey? No? <laughs> so, maybe you've noticed before, but the pastors sometimes wear these things on their gowns. Does anyone know what these are called? They look kind of like scarves, don't they? Kind of like fancy scarves, but we don't tie them up and wrap them around like that. They usually just kind of hang here. They're called stoles. And maybe you've noticed that they change color. I change mine when Pastor Redfield tells me, change your color. <laughs> but they change color with the seasons. And next week, we'll have these beautiful blue stoles. Does anyone know why they're blue? What, what's something in nature, something in nature that you see that's blue? The sky. The sky. They turn blue because during Advent, we look to the sky and we look for Jesus to come again. Now, a long time ago, they used to be purple during Advent. And purple reminds us that Jesus, that child in the manger, was a king because kings would often wear purple. And they also, the purple ones also reminded us to repent of our sins. But that changed. Now most churches, many churches, have this beautiful blue color. Sometimes things change. Even in the church, things change. Sometimes slower, sometimes faster. But the one thing we can be sure of is even if things change, our King Jesus is controlling all things. And that he, he loves you and He will be with you through all seasons of your life as you grow older, as you go through the different circles of life. King Jesus is sitting on His throne in heaven and He loves you because He died for you. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Jesus, as we journey through our lives, we ask that you always remind us that you are our King in heaven and you love us dearly. Amen. Thank you, guys. <laughs> continues to get darker until December 21st or December 22nd. And then just two days after the darkest time of the year, we celebrate the birth of the light of the world, Jesus Christ. The light that shines in the darkness, John says. The light that draws all people to himself. It's a mystery beyond comprehension, that God himself would take on human flesh and become one of us. It's a mystery beyond comprehension, but it's a mystery that reveals God's love. Like us, Jesus was born of a woman. Like us, Jesus was born under God's law. He put himself under God's law. Like us, Jesus experienced pain and suffering and even emotional distress and turmoil. But unlike us, he never once sinned. As God's perfect son, he came in our place to take up our sin and remove it through his perfect life and his innocent suffering and death. The world around us is pretty much done with Christmas on December 26th. People put their presents away or return them 
They begin to take down their Christmas decorations. And really the only time you hear the word Christmas is on after Christmas sales. But not so in the church. For 12 days after Christmas, the 12 days of Christmas, we continue to reflect on this awesome gift, the light of the world, born into our world for us. And not just those 12 days, really all year we focus our attention on that baby in a manger. In our next reading, we hear that hundreds of years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah announced that this child would be king, both now and forever. We read from Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The word of the Lord. Maybe you've heard someone say, I had an epiphany, or I had an epiphany moment. And what they mean by that is that they came to some type of realization. Something dawned on them. They had a new understanding of something. The word epiphany, here it's marked as ordinary time, but the, the, the word epiphany literally means a manifestation, something made clear to you, something that shines forth. During the Epiphany season in the church, we consider how that light born in the manger shines forth to the ends of the earth. And that Jesus, our Savior, came for all people. We see that already in the first account of Epiphany, where wise men, men who are presumably not Jews from the far east, come to worship Jesus, and they are some of the first to bow down. And worship Christ. The Savior is for us. Please stand for the two verses from Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. This is the word of our Lord. Please be seated. The word Lent comes from the old English word for lengthen. During the spring, the days begin to lengthen. And during that same time, the church focuses its attention on the suffering and death of Jesus Christ. Lent is one of the most ancient seasons of the church here. And it was traditionally observed the 40 days before.
before Easter, often a period of fasting to get ready for Easter, daily fasting. The Sundays in Lent are like little Easter's. So they don't count in the 40 days. So if you ever do the math, that's why it doesn't add up. This year, Ash Wednesday is on February 14th. A day that those of you who are married or have boyfriends or girlfriends may want to mark on the calendar as well. But February 14th, this day of love, reminds us that God's deepest love comes into our world in Jesus Christ. It's a time of repentance for us even today. What does that mean, to repent? Someone once said that repentance is one of the hardest things for human beings to do. It's not natural to admit that we're wrong. It's not natural to admit that we deserve punishment. It's not natural to ask for forgiveness. But by the power of the Holy Spirit working through the word, God leads us to remember what he says He leads us to admit that we are sinful and to acknowledge it, to lay it all out there. And then he shows us so graciously how he lays it all on his son, Jesus. Jesus came, and as we'll hear in our reading from Pilate, he was mocked and ridiculed. He was beaten. He was dressed up as a king And he was. And then he was led out to be crucified. But he rose again. He rose again as God's perfect son and as our king who now rules forever and ever. We read of his trial before Pontius Pilate in John chapter 18 and 19. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar. The chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. This is the word of our Lord. On one of the first pages of the bulletin, there's this graph that kind of shows the charts, the spikes, the highs and lows of the church here. It's meant to show you the ups and downs, the times for rejoicing and the times for sorrow as we walk through the Christian church here together. You may notice that Easter stands as the high point of the Christian church here. It's a high point because Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins, but was raised to life for our justification. 
It's the high point because Easter is proof that Jesus is the Son of God. Easter is proof that His perfect substitution in our place was accepted by God. Easter is proof that even the power of death has been destroyed. And that your loved one who died in faith will be with their Heavenly Father forever and ever. And you will too. That's the beauty of Easter, and that's why we have it as the pinnacle of the church here. All of God's promises come true in Easter. Our King has risen from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And if the first fruits have been brought, the rest are surely coming in. This is why we reserve our highest praise for Easter. For six weeks, we observe Lent. But for seven, we celebrate Easter that surpasses this time of focusing on Jesus' suffering and death. We read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The word of our Lord. Pentecost means 50. Forty days after Jesus rose from the dead, he ascended to his Father's right hand, where he now sits as king over all. Fifty days after the Passover, Jews from all over the world gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost, a celebration of the early spring harvest. They would bring their offerings to the Lord to give him thanks and to praise him. It's interesting that Jesus often compares this bringing of grain to the bringing of all people to himself. So as all these people gathered in Jerusalem, God sends out his promised Holy Spirit, and the apostles are given this ability to speak in all of these different languages. So people can hear the good news of a crucified and risen Savior and take it back to the ends of the earth. Peter stands up and preaches this powerful sermon on Pentecost. We hear about that sermon in Acts chapter 2. When the first day of, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. 
When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of our Lord. At this time, we'll continue with our prayer of the church. A couple of special prayers uh, for Jenny Radowitz, who's once again having heart difficulties. Uh, we pray for healing. Betty Haith, mother of Lori Relo, and Harold Skip Bolden were both taken home to heaven. We pray for their families. And on Saturday morning, Dr. Dorothy Schweifel, one of our shut-in members, was also taken home to Jesus. We include all of them and their families in our prayers, as well as uh, those who are listed in your bulletin. Please stand for our prayer. O Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Redeem us with your unfailing love. Around us we see signs of the last days. Wars, famine, disasters, lies, and apathy toward you. Keep us watchful for that day when you will not act. Fill us with a hunger for your word and sacraments. Strengthen our faith as we watch for your return. Build our fellowship of love as brothers and sisters in your family. Help us support one another as trials and troubles come our way. Dear Heavenly Father, in your wisdom, love, and mercy that never fail, you take your saints home to be with you. We thank you for the lives that you have given to them and for the wonderful examples and times they have had with their family and friends. We each remember someone who has died and is now living with you. We ask that you comfort all those who mourn, that you speak your loving promises, and that you abide with your presence. We ask that you help us to encourage one another and to support one another in times of difficulty and sadness. Lord, we know that times of tears and crying are often followed by times of tears of joy. We thank you for this as well. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for all those who are sick or suffering. If it is your will, we ask that you once again send your healing hand to your servant Jenny, that you help her to get better. But if it's not in all things, you give her hope and peace of trusting in you and knowing that your loving and gracious plan is being carried out. Heavenly Father, we eagerly wait for Jesus to come again and make all things new. Come, Lord Jesus, may your grace and peace be with us. Amen. At this time, we will bring forth our offering. You may be seated. If you brought your offering today, please remember to drop it in one of the boxes. We also have the online giving option.
broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. If you are commuting today, all things are now ready. You are invited to come forward at the direction of an usher. We will sing two songs during communion. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
true blood level would it say between the two sides? They gave you the same drink. Is it the Dravati? The true blood level? Take your test right now.
please stand. May the body and blood of Jesus strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith until life everlasting. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. You may be seated for our final reading. So this Sunday is Christ the King Sunday, the final Sunday of the church here. It kind of ends where it all began, and we're right back into that circle. The first half of the church here, from Advent up until the day of Pentecost, is often called the life of Christ. That's when we focus our attention on the life of Christ. The second half of the church here, in the Sundays after Pentecost... We still focus our attention on Christ, but it's more about how the Spirit works in us, in his church, to go out into that world, to live a life of love, and to preach the good news when given the opportunity. But regardless of where we are in the year, we celebrate Christ our King and look forward to his coming. We read from Revelation chapter 1. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia... Grace and peace to you from him who, was, who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The word of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. <laughs> Once again, good morning to all. So good to worship with you this morning. If you have not yet signed the guest register, please make sure to do, to do that before you leave. And then I had an announcement from our live nativity committee. Um, they have informed me that there are still many positions uh, that need to be filled, including some key actors. I think last I heard, we're still looking for a Mary and Joseph. 
Uh, so very important if you're going to retell the Christmas story to have a Mary and Joseph. Uh, so pre please think about that if you feel like you could play that role. Um, I was also asked just to show our uh, live nativity video. So we'll do that now, then I'll finish with a couple of other announcements. <laughs> 